My name is Sanjay Gupta. I'm a consultant cardiologist in York. Today I wanted to talk to you about a condition that is very prevalent uh, and yet hugely under-recognized. And this is a condition that has a huge impact on our health, our quality of life, as well as our prognosis. And it is incredibly important uh, that people become more aware of this. Right, uh, this video is entitled The Noisiest Assassin. So um, it'll, this is a slightly enigmatic title, but it'll soon become clear. Right, much of modern day medicine is about masking symptoms of sinister underlying pathology rather than identifying and treating the root cause of the problem. I believe that uh, conditions such as hypertension, diabetes, fatty liver, even cardiovascular disease are not conditions as such, but rather outwardly manifesting symptoms of chronic low-grade inflammation within the body, which has been left unidentified and unchecked for several years. Much of this low-grade inflammation could be attributed to modern-day lifestyle choices. We eat the wrong stuff. And this is not necessarily because we choose the wrong stuff, but because a lot of food is already adulterated in so many ways before it is put in front of us under the pretense of being healthy. We have become more sedentary, we do not get enough rest, and we are all more stressed now than we have ever been. Imagine buying a new car. Imagine putting in low quality fuel in it every day. Imagine overloading it daily and driving it excessively fast for prolonged periods of time without allowing the engine to cool down enough. Would it surprise anyone if that car starts developing faults earlier than expected? Unfortunately, by the time the car starts developing faults, two things become clear. Firstly, the damage is done and therefore it is impossible to reverse the damage. And secondly, more faults will start manifesting and they will start doing so with increasing frequency. The same can be said for our bodies. By the time these conditions are identified, you're already on a very slippery slope. It is therefore very important to be vigilant and identify faults in our lifestyles which could be causing inflammation within us before that inflammation manifests as a medical condition. Unfortunately, we cannot rely on healthcare professionals anymore. Most healthcare professionals aren't even healthcare professionals. They are sickness care professionals. They are interested in your sickness, not in your health. If you look healthy, they are not interested. This is a shame because healthcare should be about preserving health rather than taking an interest in the patient only after they have lost their health. Today, I wanted to talk about a condition that is rapidly becoming a global epidemic and yet remains remarkably under-recognized and under-diagnosed. Unfortunately, many doctors don't think about it, and even when they do, they sometimes use the wrong tools to decide whether the patient may be suffering from the condition or not. This is a condition which can present with non-specific symptoms, but if left untreated, will substantially increase the risk of virtually all chronic conditions, including hypertension, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, strokes, and dementia. This condition is called obstructive sleep apnea. Obstructive sleep apnea is a potentially serious sleep disorder which causes breathing to repeatedly stop and start during sleep. It happens when the muscles and the soft tissue in the throat relax and collapse sufficiently to cause a total blockage of the windpipe. People with sleep apnea will experience repeated airway blockages throughout the night and during each episode the effort to breathe in against the blocked airway uh, will lighten sleep or even cause awakening uh, so that the airway can be enabled to open up and breathing resumes. This can happen several times an hour and is exceptionally stressful for the body at a time when the body is meant to be relaxing. This Stress will then start manifesting as headaches, irritability, a predilection for sweet foods, caffeine, and then it will manifest with obesity, hypertension, diabetes, vascular disease, heart rhythm abnormalities, and even sudden death. Why is it important? Obstructive sleep apnea will significantly impair quality of life and can significantly impact or shorten a patient's lifespan. How common is it? Very common. 15 to 30% of all men probably have it, certainly in the Western world. 
10 to 15 percent of all women have it so the point is that if you are in a collection of say 10 people you'll identify two two maybe three men who will have sleep apnea and perhaps one or two women who will have sleep apnea in that group of people that you know so very common indeed now there is a common misconception that sleep apnea only affects obese patients this is a common misconception whilst it's true to say that it is more prevalent in the obese it is also not uncommon in the non-obese there was a research paper by Gray et al. published in 2017 in the Journal of Sleep Medicine, which looked at the prevalence of sleep apnea in the non-obese and found that almost 5% of non-obese men and 1% of non-obese women between the ages of 30 to 49 had sleep apnea. And more worryingly, these figures rose to 14% in men and 5% in women in non-obese patients aged between 50 and 70 years. Generally speaking, up to 20% of all patients with sleep apnea are not obese. There was another really interesting study published in the American Journal of Cardiology. The author was Luister, L-U-Y-S-T-E-R, et al. It was published in 2014. And they basically found that non-obese patients with sleep apnea were found to have 2.7-fold higher chance of having coronary disease compared to age-matched patients who did not have sleep apnea. What are the symptoms of sleep apnea? Daytime sleepiness, non-restorative, non-refreshing sleep, loud snoring, with witnessed uh, apneas in sleep where the patient is noticed to stop breathing intermittently, awakening with choking or gasping, nocturnal restlessness, insomnia with frequent awakenings, lack of concentration, cognitive deficits, changes in mood, morning headaches, vivid, strange or threatening dreams, nocturia, which refers to frequent urination at night. Patients with sleep apnea rarely wake up feeling refreshed. Often they're tired and can experience excessive sleepiness during waking hours. In, in very severe cases, they may even nod off whilst talking or eating. Often the patient's partner will notice loud snoring, noisy or labored breathing, repeated short periods where the breathing is interrupted by gasping or snoring and depression, headaches and mood swings. How can you tell if you may have it well, the, the answer is you have to actively look for it because the symptoms can be nonspecific and insidious and because they come on so gradually, people just think it's them. You know, people wake up with headaches and they just think it's them. They think, oh, I just wake up with a headache and I need a coffee to wake me up. Maybe it isn't that that is normal for them. Maybe they have sleep apnea. The best test to look for it is polysomnography. Polysomnography is a non-invasive and painless test which is performed when the patient is asleep to allow sleep patterns to be observed and monitored. The patient is connected to a systems monitor which then measures several different variables including brain waves, eye movement, heart rate, breathing rates, blood oxygen levels, positioning of the body, movement of the limbs and sounds which are made while sleeping and each of these factors are then plotted on a graph and they help build a cohesive picture of overall sleep quality. Unfortunately, the problem is polysomnography requires specialized equipment and specialized personnel and therefore it is not as easily accessible. However, there are some easy to use screening questionnaires that can help patients screen themselves. And if, if indeed you score highly, then you can make a really compelling case to undergo polysomnography. And the two most commonly used questionnaire are, number one, something called the Stop Bang Questionnaire, and number two, the Epworth Sleepiness Scale. And I'll go through them with you today, okay? Of both of these, the stop bang questionnaire is far more reliable, even though many of the times doctors will use the Epworth scale. So let's talk about the stop bang questionnaire. Okay, You use the following questionnaire um, to assess whether you may be suffering from sleep apnea. Stop bang stands for S. The S stands for snoring. Does the patient snore loudly, louder than uh, talking or loud enough to be heard through closed doors? Okay, and you have to score that as yes or no. 
number two, T stands for tired. Does the patient often feel tired, fatigued or sleepy during the day? Again, answer that as yes or no. O is observation. Has anyone observed the patient to stop breathing during sleep? P stands for pressure. Does the patient have or is the patient being treated for high blood pressure? B on the stop bank stands for BMI. Does the patient have a BMI of greater than 35? A stands for age. Is the patient older than 50? N stands for neck. Is the patient's neck circumference greater than 40 centimeters? And G stands for gender. Is the patient male? Now, if you score between zero and two to these questions, then you classify as being at low risk of sleep apnea. If you score three to four, you score as being intermediate risk. And if you say yes to five to eight questions, then you are at high risk of, develop of having sleep apnea. This was something that was developed by an author called Chung um, and was published in 2008. So I think anyone who's watching this should do this mentally and say, well, where do I score on this? Uh, if you score less than, if you score two or less, you're low risk. But if you score higher than that, three or more, then it is certainly worth considering the possibility that there may be a component of sleep apnea. Of course, sleep apnea is, you know, it, it can range, right? You can have mild sleep apnea, you can have severe sleep apnea. So even though you may not score uh, yes for everything, even if you score uh, yes to three questions, then that could still signify that you may have an underlying component of sleep apnea. And those are exactly the patients who want to know about it and treat it early on so that it does not start contributing to the uh, gradual worsening in the sleep apnea severity, but also in terms of the inflammation. Now, sleepiness is the main disabling symptom of obstructive sleep apnea, and the Epworth sleepiness scale can help you measure how sleepy you are. So I think it's the way we use the Epworth scale is we score on how likely we are to doze off or fall asleep in certain situations. And they have a scoring system which ranges from zero, meaning I would never doze, to three, I have a high chance of dozing. So zero would never doze, one slight chance of dozing, two moderate chance of dozing, and three high chance of dozing. So here are the situations, you know, and you have to score between zero and three. Sitting and reading, watching TV, sitting inactive in a public place, e.g. theatre or meeting, as a passenger in a car for an hour without a break, lying down in the afternoon, sitting and talking to someone, sitting quietly after lunch without alcohol, in a car while stopped for a few minutes in traffic, and then what you do is you calculate the score. And if, you, if your score is 10 or over, you may indeed have a sleep disorder such as obstructive sleep apnea. So these are two really valuable questionnaires that are available to everyone. They're available online. They're available through this video. And I definitely think everyone who's watching this video should ask themselves these questions and just make sure that they don't have a component of sleep apnea. Because if it is identified, then it can be treated. The most effective treatment is known as CPAP. CPAP stands for Continuous Positive Airway Pressure. This is delivered by a small quiet pump besides the bed, which continuously delivers slightly pressurized air through a hose to a mask worn during sleeping hours. So air is pumped continuously at a pressure to keep the airways open so the airways don't collapse, which means that the patient doesn't have to wake up to breathe. Unfortunately, not everyone tolerates sleep CPAP, but those who do report significant benefits in sleep quality and overall quality of life. Better sleep means more rest. More rest means less inflammation. I hope you found this useful and will use the questionnaire I've provided to screen yourself for sleep apnea. If you do score highly, then please, please, please don't put it off. Speak with your doctor and request polysomnography. 
I'd be very interested in knowing your stop bank scores. So I'll put out a poll on my YouTube community page and it would be great if you could enter your scores. Um, and that way we would know how many people uh, who view my channel uh, score highly on this. I want to leave you with an important thought. And that is that we live in a society where your sickness is unfortunately far more profitable than your health. The only people who stand to profit from your good health are you and your loved ones. Everyone else stands to profit from your sickness. This is why we owe it to ourselves and our loved ones to become well-informed and empowered to act as our own advocates. I would be so grateful if you would consider sharing this video with anyone who may benefit. If this video helps even one person, then it would totally make my day. Thank you so much. All the best.